Chapter Seven of Travels and Adventures of an Orchid Hunter by Albert Milliken. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Canoe Life on the Labria. The river Labria is the finest river draining the state of Santander, a tributary of the Magdalena, rising in what is called La Mesa de Juan Rodriguez in the eastern Andes at a height of about nine thousand feet above the level of the sea passing the town of p de cuesta on the northeast side and running through the old spanish town of huron following the department of soto in the state of santander and emptying itself into the magdalena at a place called bodega central a small boat station of comparatively recent construction perhaps there is no better means of getting a good experience of what canoe life really is than by taking a journey on this river going up there are the long weary days with a burning sun and cramped privation dragging the canoe over the rocky shallows and in descending there are the fearful rapids and whirlpools where many of the canoes with their freight and passengers are lost every year Thousands of bags of coffee are annually brought down from the interior on this river, and a corresponding number of bales of manufactured goods are carried up. The town of Bucaramanga contains about 50,000 inhabitants, and every one of these who would make a journey to the coast, however distinguished or delicate, from the polished Spanish lady to the hardiest Indian, must submit to a six days imprisonment in one of these miserable craft on the river labria or another branch river called the sogamoso where the circumstances are pretty much the same the only way to this large interior town being by way of these rivers with the alternative of the overland route which is a hundred miles tramp through the forest with men bearing provisions when i made the ascent of the labria i left the magdalena steamboat at bodega central which is largely owned by two estimable merchants messrs lopez and navarro and is remarkable for the immense thatched warehouses crowded with piles of bags of coffee hides gutta percha cocoa plants and various other products of the magnificent state of santander one of the richest most important and most progressive states in the republic of colombia messrs lopez and navarro besides owning most of the canoes on the river also have several small steam launches which ply on the labria to a place called estacion santander i took passage as far as the steamboat went and we left bodega central at four a m in the little launch called la primera we steamed across the magdalena and entered the mouth of the labria daylight coming about half past five and with it a sight of more natural beauty than i had seen before i greatly enjoyed the wild magnificence of the forest and the enormous timber trees festooned with such a profusion of gorgeous flowering creepers supplemented by thickets of graceful palms and bamboos the banks of the river are intersected at intervals by small streams which drain the adjoining forest and sluggishly empty themselves into the main river at each of these outlets a sight presents itself which would enchant the most stoical naturalist several huge alligators lounge lazily in the soft mud as far as the eye can reach up the creek crowds of ducks are actually huddled together each one brushing his neighbor to get fishing room the principal species is called by the colombians el pato real or royal duck a wild muscovy weighing sometimes from eight to ten pounds color a greenish black with white patches on the wings another which is called in spanish pato de aguja is one of the divers having the body black and the long neck covered with a peculiar ashy colored down the long snake-like neck tapering to the fineness of a penknife at the end of the beak i shot some of both species and they proved excellent food the low bushes trailing in the water of the stream are literally white with small cranes wistfully waiting for some careless fish while the tall trees are bristling with large cranes of various classes 
the osprey or fishing eagle and kingfishers complete the collection i would gladly have secured a photograph of so interesting a sight but as the little steamboat arrived opposite to them they invariably rose like a cloud and after wheeling around in the air several times alighted a few yards off to wait until the disturbance was past the streams above mentioned run into the labria at intervals and as we passed each one all on board seemed carried away with a desire to possess some specimen of these myriads of beautiful waterfowl many large trunks of trees torn from the banks and brought down the river by floods made the navigation very difficult as we experienced when about midday our little boat ran foul of an enormous log and it was only after two hours work with axes and bars that we were at liberty to proceed besides this there is the delay occasioned by taking on wood for the engines however eventually we arrived at estacion santander something like sixty miles in about ten hours the appearance of the village is not very prepossessing the houses being of the most miserable construction made of stems of the wild cane bound together with creepers like huge bird cages thatched with palm leaves these huts are almost entirely occupied by native boatmen or as they are called in spanish bogas occasionally these sheds are made extra long and divided into compartments by a lattice-work of wild cane each division containing at least one family the situation is even worse than the village being the edge of an extensive swamp covered with rank grass in many parts intersected with pools of stagnant water and in the rainy season being entirely flooded here the night dews are very heavy and the air is continually charged with miasma making it almost impossible for any european to live long in such a climate the heat being also unbearable and the mosquitoes legion this is the principal station for canoes on the river and they are tied up to the bank in great numbers from the most primitive hollow tree that will hold two men with difficulty to the clumsy construction which carries fifty bags of coffee and six men something like two hundred native boatmen live in the huts of this station they are of the coarsest negro type and about as low a form of civilization as it is possible to find excepting a tribe of wild indians they are absolutely averse to any kind of work except that of the canoe so that whatever social advancement might be offered to them they would not accept it however in the management of the canoe they are invaluable for out of the hundreds of times they make the journey of the river shooting the terrific rapids at lightning speed besides hauling the canoe and cargo over fallen trees with which the river is almost impassable or in the dry season working in the water cutting channels not two per cent of the canoes and freight are actually lost for two days after i arrived at estacion santander i was not able to get a canoe going up the river so to pass the time in so miserable a situation i went alligator hunting two or three species of alligator abound in all the swamps and rivers but the most common is the large caiman which grows to a length of some eighteen to twenty feet and attains an enormous bulk we had not far to go before we met with several and this being the breeding season they were especially hasty tempered when compared with their usual sluggish disposition the female scratches a hole in the sand a few yards away from the water's edge here she deposits a large number of eggs from twenty-five to seventy i have never found them more than one foot and a half deep but always on a sandbank considerably elevated above the river to prevent them being washed away with the floods the months of february and march is the time when the alligators deposit their eggs and it is extremely dangerous to go near the female when so doing the huge animal disturbed on the nest first gives warning of hostile intentions by uttering a loud hissing sound like a snake and by puffing out the neck and opening her monstrous jaws the intruder who after these warnings disregards them must be a good shot and armed with a good weapon or otherwise very careless of his life 
although the natives are careful not to expose themselves too much in the water of the river many people are annually killed by alligators if a fisherman advances too far into the water or some unfortunate indian upsets his canoe he very often falls an easy prey to the lurking monsters which lie at the bottom of the river in perfect shoals watching for large fish or whatever living being may stray within reach and once between those terrible teeth all hope must be abandoned for i have never heard of a single escape the armor on the back of the alligator is made of a large quantity of stout bone plates under the skin these are very difficult to penetrate but the vulnerable parts are the eye and behind the shoulder a ball well planted in either situation is certain to kill our day's sport ended with two males and one female all of which the natives managed to drag to the station and skin only utilizing the skin of the under side of the animal one of them measured seventeen feet and the other fifteen feet fairly good specimens but not very large next day i set about getting together the natives for the canoe and providing a stock of dried fish salt beef cassava root bananas and some coffee together with cooking utensils fishing nets guns and ammunition it is also necessary to construct an awning over the canoe to somewhat break the glare of an overpowering sun the following day after much delay i mustered my company of six men and we started up the swift running muddy stream not forgetting to take with us a large bottle of native spirit called aguardiente a liquor made from the sugar cane of a disgusting taste and unbounded strength which one would say in ordinary phraseology is warranted to kill at a thousand yards indeed the native boatmen are so accustomed to the use of this drug that the alcohol eventually loses its effect upon them an amusing instance happened on the journey up the river i had taken a bottle of alcohol with me to use in a spirit lamp with the object of boiling water to make tea on the journey but by some mistake a pint bottle of alcohol was given to the native boatmen instead of the aguardiente unfortunately for me they drank every drop of the fiery substance with no worse effect than to slightly intoxicate them i only discovered the mistake when i went to seek the alcohol to make my tea and found instead only a bottle of native spirit which would not burn the boatmen seemed to leave their huts with the utmost reluctance and proceeded very slowly in their homes they wear some clothing and many of them even a decent suit but once away from the village they discard every vestige of clothing in order to be more ready to jump into the river when pleasure or necessity prompts them we had not gone far up the river when the natives struck with a fit of laziness took to the woods and left me with one man in the canoe to do the best i could of course it was impossible for me to proceed without them so i took my gun and went off into the forest to see if there was anything to shoot there are plenty of wild pigs and the taper called by the natives la danta but it is difficult to get a shot at it without having some dogs i was not long in coming up with some of the natives engaged in fishing in a small lake about two and a half miles from the river the water muddy and stagnant but so full of fish that there was no need of the wily patience generally employed in angling the only difficulty was to get the fish off the hooks quickly enough so eager were they to bite in about two hours we had taken as many as four men could carry the fish were of three kinds one about twelve inches long covered with silvery scales having a very small mouth this is called by the natives boca chica or little mouth it is the fish that most abounds in all parts of colombia and is excellent eating probably a kind of perch the next is la dorada or the gilded fish from eighteen to twenty inches in length and five inches in girth the flesh of this is inferior to that of the boca chica but the appearance is most wonderful the scales especially around the head are of a glistening yellow making one believe it is wearing a suit of gold gilt armor the other a short ugly fish with formidable rows of teeth like a miniature shark is called by the natives manchalo this fish proved the best food 
by the time we had gathered our booty together the sun low in the heavens warned us that it would soon be dark and we hurried back to the canoe as quickly as possible the natives gathering wood and making a fire we all partook of boiled fish bananas and a little coffee after this every one stretched himself on the sandbank and prepared to wait until morning amid crowds of hungry mosquitoes although the natives dispense with everything having only the sky for a roof yet to a european the heavy dews are very injurious and it is always a good precaution to erect a kind of awning of palm leaves to prevent the clothes being soaked during the night by daybreak every one was astir and the bananas and black coffee were enjoyed with as much gusto as an englishman would enjoy the proverbial ham and eggs we were soon moving slowly up the river the natives working as usual without a particle of clothing in a vertical sun only now and then stopping to jump into the river to refresh themselves with a bath on account of the swiftness of the river it is impossible to use oars except for crossing but the labor of pushing the boat along by the sandbank is more tiring so much so that no european would be able to endure it for more than a few days in the forenoon i had excellent shooting from amongst a flock of parrots and waterfowl the banks of the river were alive with the beautiful egret cranes and the trees full of macaws some scarlet and blue some blue and yellow about midday we partook of our usual rations of fish and bananas with palm wine the process of making the palm wine is somewhat curious the largest of the trees are selected and cut down then when the tree is laid flat the whole of the leaves which fall uppermost are cut away until the white young growth in the middle of the tree is laid bare out of this part a large square piece is cut sufficient to leave a hollow which will hold at least a quart of water then the hollow is carefully covered over and the palm wine maker waits until next morning as a rule when he returns he finds the cavity filled with a whitish liquor having the appearance and taste of lemonade only a little sour but very refreshing and beneficial about three o'clock we arrived at a small station of two or three huts here the natives learned that there was a herd of wild swine in the vicinity so all progress up the river was stopped as the boatmen would go no further that day everybody was on the alert for a hunt so all the dogs of the place were got together and two rusty old guns which were all the station could muster most of the natives being armed with lances and what is called here the machete or cutlass away we started into the forest trampling down and cutting through the beautiful strelitzias delicate palms and gorgeous creepers with the help of the dogs we were not long in finding the track of the herd and then we went on about an hour before we came up with them the natives wore next to no clothing but mine was reduced to shreds in the desperate struggle with the thorns and creepers the first sign of the herd was given to us by a pattering sound and a very rank smell besides the barking of dogs presently we appeared to have dropped into the middle of them as every part of the forest seemed alive with wild pigs there must have been at least three hundred rushing backwards and forwards in the wildest confusion some of the natives darting through amongst the trees with the dogs trying to keep the herd together others firing as quickly as they could reload their guns and some using their cutlasses to kill as many as possible after about a quarter of an hour of the most exciting fight that it is possible to imagine the whole of the herd that remained unwounded had disappeared leaving us to dispatch the wounded and gather up the dead when we were able to collect them together we found seven as the proceeds of the raid these were shouldered and carried in triumph to the camp the cooking process was not a long one the flesh of the young peccary is excellent but that of the older ones is somewhat inferior the largest weigh from thirty to forty pounds and are very much like small domesticated pigs of a dull black color and having coarse bristles the head and nose are very long in proportion to the body and the feet very small herds of young peccaries abound in these forests in such large quantities that the natives can always have fresh meat when they are not too lazy to hunt 
It being already dark when we returned to the camp, I contented myself here for the night, and we started by daylight next morning without any breakfast, as the natives would not wait. So, as a passenger has absolutely no authority over them, I thought it best to let them go when they were in the humor. We took with us a good supply of the flesh of the peccaries, and later, when the boatmen felt inclined, we stopped at a sandbank, and while one party lighted a fire and prepared breakfast, the others went in search of turtles' eggs. The nest of the turtles are discovered in a very curious manner. To an ordinary observer nothing is to be seen but an expanse of flat sand, but the men returned with over two hundred eggs the means of discovering them being to pierce the sand at intervals with a stout stick to find the cavity containing the eggs. The turtle comes out of the river during the night and scratches a deep hole in the sand. In these holes the eggs are deposited all in one night, and not, as is generally supposed, in several nights. I have read accounts of more than a hundred eggs being laid by one turtle, but I am not inclined to believe the story, as the oldest native told me he had never found more than three dozen in a nest of one turtle. It often happens, however, that two or three deposit their eggs so close together that they are easily mistaken for one nest. About midday we arrived at a small village called Papayal, a canoe station of little importance. Here I bought some provisions and stayed about an hour. When I was ready to start again, I found it almost impossible to persuade the natives to proceed with the canoe. After very much trouble, I got them on board, and we continued lazily up the river. That night we camped on a sandbank, the opposite side of the river being the edge of a thick forest. The boatmen lighted a fire and partook of supper, and then, probably fatigued with the toil of the day and the unbearable heat, they were soon stretched on the sand, sleeping heavily. I was unable to sleep on account of the mosquitoes, so I sat down to contemplate the grandeur of the situation. The full moon lighted up the dense forest with a kind of weird, unnatural beauty, and a stillness reigned around that would make one believe we had camped on the territory of the dead. Towards midnight, what appeared before so deserted became suddenly animated. Large flights of white cranes arrived and poised themselves on the branches nearest the river, while as many more of the tall gray ones took up quarters on the edge of the sandbank, waiting as far as their long legs would allow. The alligators, which up to the present had kept carefully under the water, began to make an appearance, first poking their heads cautiously out, then dragging their long bodies out on the sand while a crowd of about a dozen turtles raced out of the water. The opposite bank was not less animated than the one on which our canoe was moored. I could hear the peccaries grunting and rushing about in search of food. Several deer and one taper came down to the water to drink, being distinctly visible in the clear moonlight. The occasional sharp bark of the ocelot and the deep growl of the jaguar together with the mimic roar of the howler monkey and the low prolonged wailing of the sloth, seemed fit accompaniment for so wild a place. I lay down to rest, leaving them in the height of activity, and when daylight came nothing was to be seen of my midnight visitors but footprints. All this day we kept on steadily up the swift running stream, little of importance taking place, and in the evening we camped again on a sandbank, from here we could see the long blue line of the tops of the Andes away on the horizon, but still at a considerable distance on account of the winding of the river. End of chapter 7 Recording by Arnold Banner, Thurmond, North Carolina Chapter 8 of Travels and Adventures of an Orchid Hunter by Albert Milliken this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Shooting the Rapids Next day we came to some rapids, which extended a considerable distance, where the water rushed down a declivity with terrific velocity. Here the natives were obliged to bring the canoe to the bank on the shallowest side, and, all jumping into the water, literally lifted the boat up through the foaming torrent 
wading up to the neck in the water and making a great noise shouting to each other in their bad spanish by way of encouragement when we had got clear of the rapids we stopped to rest and while we were there three canoes laden with coffee came down the river and joined us i was curious to see how they would shoot the rapids a mile of rushing foaming torrent intersected at intervals by enormous trunks of trees which at some time or other had been brought down the stream and were now firmly embedded in the banks these obstacles caused the angry weight of water to eddy and boil like a monster cauldron the principal danger to the canoes shooting these rapids is the probability of being dashed to pieces against some of these hidden destroyers the boatmen seemed to understand fully their desperate danger and as the first canoe moved away from the bank i could hear them encouraging each other the first canoe was loaded with forty bags of coffee and no sooner was the frail bark pushed off from the side than it was caught in the current the descent from where we were to the still waters below occupied about five minutes and so great was the velocity that had the canoe only jarred with any of the projections of the banks it must inevitably have been dashed to pieces but the skill of the natives is so great that they guided the whole of the canoes safely into the calmer waters below and once clear of their danger gave an exulting shout which we could hear above the roar of the rapids after little more progress night came upon us again i had been fortunate through the day in shooting some ducks so we had no lack of food next day we started by daybreak and as we neared the higher part of the river we found it in many places very shallow and on this account we had a piece of sport which was quite new to me this was a race with a large fish called by the natives savalo somewhat like a salmon they seemed to be fond of feeding in the shallows on the edge of the sandbanks and at a considerable distance away we could see their movements in the water so directly we brought the canoe opposite to them the boatmen jumped into the river and gave chase driving them as much as possible into the shallowest part the chase was most exciting six natives to four fish dodging each other with such surprising agility that they only lost one the others being killed by a stroke of the machete which the natives use with such dexterity it was impossible for me to learn the scientific name of this beautiful fish it is very symmetrical in form about two feet and a half in length and is covered with scales of a peculiar shape and enormous size each one larger than a crown and glittering like burnished silver i have seen the same fish grow to a size of seven feet long and two feet six inches in girth when cooked it proved somewhat unsavory and considerably less palatable than beautiful about midday on the sixth day from starting we arrived at the foot of the andes and about four o'clock in the afternoon after great cheering and salutation from one lot of boatmen to another we landed at the port called botijas no very inviting place but at least a relief to get liberty from the cramping confinement of the canoe a large sheet-iron warehouse and a few miserable thatched huts are all that the inhabitants can boast of to make up their village this place has proved the most unhealthy one or two colombians are placed here by the merchants of the interior to look after the despatch of cargo by the canoes these poor fellows are only able to stay about a month and then seek the higher ground to recruit themselves from the terrible malarial fever which inevitably fastens itself upon them all the produce going down the river in canoes arrives here on mules and some hundreds may be seen at a time loading and unloading bags of coffee bales of gutta percha or cases of plants very few stay more than one day on account of the climate as the village is situated at the foot of the mountain the ascent can be made in about two hours to a large country house called el volador built on a ridge of the mountain several thousand feet above the river la Bria. on the top of the mountain the air is fresh and cool and the climate good from here to the town of bucaramanga the journey can be made in two days over a tolerably good mule track 
which passes through the midst of many beautiful plantations of coffee, tobacco, and sugar cane. What appears most extraordinary to the traveler when he mounts up to the top of the range of mountains which overlooks the town of Bucaramanga is to find a large town of about fifty thousand inhabitants at so great a distance from any port and so thoroughly isolated at the tops of the Andes. The natural situation is very beautiful, the town being built upon an extensive plain, about three thousand feet above the level of the sea, and this plain entirely surrounded by high mountains, and these mountains for a considerable distance up the side adorned with pretty country houses, each one with a patch of sugar cane, a plantation of coffee or tobacco, while as far as the eye can reach is an extent of pastures, enriched with splendid herds of cattle and troops of half-wild horses, while the tops of the mountains tower into the clouds, which shroud them day and night with a veil of impenetrable mist. The plain on which the town is built, as well as most of the adjoining land, has long been celebrated for the gold found there, and especially in the old-fashioned village of Iran, where the Spanish conquerors found sufficient to load their ships with hordes of treasure. The gold is very good, but many of the mines discovered by the Spaniards have been lost or abandoned, and those which remain, although they still yield largely, are not so profitable as in former years. Once inside the town of Bucaramanga, the whole arrangement is most novel. The streets are very narrow and paved, being highest at the sides, and having a stream of water running down the middle of each of the principal thoroughfares, serving at once for the supply of the town and for sanitary purposes. The water is generally taken from some stream in the nearest mountainside and brought by conduits to the town, where in various branches it is made to pass through all the principal streets, and again in hundreds of branches is carried to form the many beautiful baths and fountains which are found in the houses of the rich Colombians. As a rule, the houses which form the suburbs of the town are miserable, tumble-down constructions, and the streets are so uneven that they will scarcely admit of wheeled vehicles passing along them, so that every kind of conveyance, such as cabs, omnibuses, wagons, etc., is entirely unknown in this mountain retreat. The houses are principally one story high, and the long streets in which the whole of the houses seem to have been made from the same model give the place an appearance of dull sameness, perfectly unbearable to a European. But once inside the door of one of the best of these houses, everything is changed. The apartments are built to open into a square or garden, generally cooled by a splashing fountain, and planted with innumerable sweet-smelling flowering shrubs and gorgeous orchids. The largest hall or reception room takes up the whole of the square adjoining the street, so that on the one side the windows overlook the traffic and passers-by, while on the other side large folding doors open to a wealth of floral beauty. These saloons are often most gorgeously furnished. The richest gilding, the choicest pictures, carpets from Persia and draperies from India, with an extravagance in silver and bric-a-brac almost impossible to believe could ever be found on the tops of the Andes. Two sides of the square are taken up by the bedrooms, which also open into this floral promenade, the remaining side of the square being reserved for the dining room, and on account of the perpetual mildness of the climate, this hall is left entirely open on one side, so that the well-to-do Colombian, instead of requiring floral decorations to adorn his dinner table, literally dines under the shade of orange trees laden with blossom and fruit, Huge gardenias, whose crowds of waxen flowers fill the air with their exquisite perfume, with large clumps of the lovely orchid, Catlia mendelii, give to the whole group a masterly finish of color. The business houses of Bucaramanga are quite equal to any in other parts of Colombia, and a large trade is done in cotton goods and hardware, as well as immense exportation of products of the country. There are many excellent hotels, a club, telegraph and telephone offices, post office and banks are to be found, while the latest novelty for the tops of the Andes is to be the electric light, 
the machinery being at the time i write this on the way from europe to be carried up the mountains on the backs of mules apart from all this what strikes the visitor as the most curious of all the curiosities of bucaramanga is the market which is held some three times a week in the principal plaza an extensive square in front of the church here every saturday may be found such a collection of products of a diversity of character as is rarely met with flesh meat is sold under small tents to protect it from the blaze of the sun while bales of gutta percha sacks of coffee and rolls of tobacco are heaped up in the midst of stores of merchandise from europe potatoes and indian corn raw sugar and bananas oranges peaches and figs all jumbled together topsy-turvy the people are no less remarkable for their diversity of color character and nationality here a sharp german trader may be seen bartering with a red indian over a cent in the price of a pound of coffee or some elegant colombian lady jostles with the rough indians of the hills in the excitement to secure some delicious fruit or extra fine capon sisters of mercy roman catholic priests a large percentage of germans a few frenchmen and italians together with the educated colombians negroes and half-breeds are all intent upon making the best bargain the principal trade of the town in the importation of manufactured goods is in the hands of german traders of which there are many important houses as well as a few rich colombians the educated society of colombia has always been noted for its capacity and intelligence and bucaramanga besides possessing several good schools and a college has given to the country from time to time many celebrated men both in literary political and scientific pursuits while the state of santander undoubtedly has a population of the most industrious class of people to be found in colombia dr aurelio mutas one of the most popular inhabitants of bucaramanga as well as of this state was educated in medical colleges in london edinburgh and paris he is a man of most affable character coupled with the sprightly vivacity of the men of his race polished and accomplished in the highest degree he speaks fluently spanish english french and italian as a medical man he is equally in request in the palace of the millionaire and the indian hut and it is said that in his long experience in this large town of so diversified a class of inhabitants none ever asked for his help and was turned away as a political man he has lately become famous having been for a short time governor of the state and then secretary for education he is at present in england acting as consul for columbia in the port of southampton my journey was made in search of the fairy tribe of orchids and as up to the present i had not even seen a single plant of value i was delighted to learn that the early botanists had found the gorgeous cattleya mendelii growing around here in profusion now however through the immense exportation of these plants not a single one is to be found within many days journey from here on mules i accordingly set about hiring mules for myself and baggage and again started off in search of the capricious flower this time the way ran along the valley of la florida passing on the way large works in progress for taking water to wash the gold-bearing sand of the vicinity nearly the whole of the land along the valley is carefully cultivated the beautiful crops of waving sugar-cane maize and tobacco and the rich pastures stocked with peaceful herds of cattle give one a feeling of european surroundings on each side of the valley the mighty peaks of the andes tower up to the clouds all bristling with forest twelve miles of the most agreeable riding brought us to an old spanish town called pied de cuesta or in english foot of the hill this place contains about twelve thousand inhabitants peaceable industrious people mostly employed in making cigars and straw hats as well as in agricultural pursuits in the whole of my variations in life and circumstances i have found no town or village i have liked so much as the quiet beautiful dreamy old town of p de cuesta 
about thirty five hundred feet above the level of the sea with something like twelve hours of day and twelve hours of night all the year round a mild balmy air which is never oppressively hot or disagreeably cold an abundance of pure water and a rich variety of tropical fruits the majority of the houses are commodious and even spacious while the people at the same time possessing all the sprightly wit of the modern colombian are free from that knavish overreaching disposition which develops into a system of roguery in most of the outlying mountain villages the natural situation of the town is as admirable as the climate and the people are agreeable i was glad to find the beautiful epidendrum atropurpureum covering the walls around the houses and flowering in profusion and here also i found one of the most beautiful of the south american birds the scarlet and black tanager this is called here by the natives the cardinal bird and compared with a flock of these no roman prelate ever made a more brilliant effect it is a small bird about the size of a starling the wings and tail of a velvety black colour while the rest of the body is a most intense scarlet the otherwise black beak is adorned with something like plates of ivory on each side of the lower mandible i was delighted to obtain several good specimens of this gaudy little woodland gem the mule track on leaving p de cuesta keeps along the fertile banks of a stream in a southern direction for some miles and then commences an ascent of about one thousand feet until we reach what is called la mesa de los santos an extensive plain where the wild indian must have ranged and camped at will in the time when the spanish yoke was unknown the vegetation consists of a tall rank herbage with occasional scrub intermixed with thousands of the beautiful sobralia leucoxantha with rose and white flowers of the colour and substance of a cattleya mendelii but so difficult to transport that very few of the plants are known in england the inhabitants of this magnificent plain are mostly cattle keepers who are possessed of the best class of horses to be found in this part of the country they are also celebrated for their splendid horsemanship every morning they may be seen careering over the expanse of prairie with a lasso of about thirty yards long of raw cowhide tied to the pommel of the saddle and wearing a pair of very wide leggings which are strapped round them at the waist and float in the wind on either side something like a lady's dress these half breeches half leggings are called in the spanish zamaros the saddle is as peculiar a production as the rest of the arrangement being raised up very high at the front and back so that the horseman appears to sit in a chair a square piece of cloth with a hole cut in the middle for the neck is thrown over the shoulders this and a wide-brimmed straw hat complete the curious costume of a colombian cattle ranger one side of la mesa de los santos is bounded by immense precipices some of them over two hundred feet in height these are the haunts of several birds of prey most notably the condor or as it is called in the spanish el butre this gigantic bird has a spread of wing of six feet and has strength to rise from the ground with a fair-sized calf i have seen them wheeling around at a considerable height and they seem to alight on the ground very rarely the native's mode of killing them is to slaughter an old horse or other large animal on the edge of a precipice and the quick-sighted bird is down upon the carcass before life is quite gone the natives wait in ambush until the monster bird is gorged with the flesh so as to be unable to rise quickly into the air the lurking indian watches his opportunity and with the agility of a deer falls upon the condor with spears and generally comes off victorious on the ledges of these precipices where the eagle and the condor make their home the lovely cattleya mendelii has grown in profusion since the memory of man even when the first plant hunter arrived these dizzy heights offered no obstacle to his determination to plunder natives were let down by means of ropes and by the same ropes the plants were hauled up in thousands and when i visited the place all that i could see of its former beauty and wealth of plants was an occasional straggling bulb 
hung as if in mid-air on some point only accessible to the eagles i left the place impressed with the magnificence of the scenery but disappointed in my search for plants continuing over the plain we arrived at a small village of ancient spanish construction called los santos situated on the very edge of a declivity of about one thousand feet in the valley below runs the turbulent little river subi formerly called by the indians the chichamoca on the opposite side of the valley mighty precipices rise to the same height as the one on which we stood it seems as if the river had once flowed over the level plain but floods during centuries had cut out the terrible chasm which opened so suddenly to the traveller the distance from one line of precipices to the other at the top is about a mile and a half and the mule track was down the mountain side across the river and up the other side on to the plain beyond the descent occupied about an hour and a half of the most perilous winding about amongst rocks and creeping along shelving ledges where the mules with one false step would have been dashed to pieces at intervals we came to small huts the occupation of the owners being to keep goats of which there were many large herds nimbly jumping from rock to rock cropping the scant herbage which scarcely finds room to grow amongst the crowds of american aloes and other prickly cacti on arriving at the little village called subi i was surprised at the great change of temperature instead of the fresh bracing air of the plain the heat here is intense the thermometer seldom falling below one hundred degrees in the shade the village has lately become a health resort for invalids suffering from diseases of the skin many of the patients may be seen all day bathing in the swift running stream the waters of which although coming from the high cold hills become warmed in their transit through this burning valley here also i found a lovely little bird which i had not seen before a small creeper about the size of a robin with dusky brown wings but having the breast of a brilliant scarlet and wearing on the head a crest of long feathers of the same gaudy colour which it raises or lowers at pleasure i was glad to rest our mules and pass the night here but long before daylight next morning we began to make the ascent of the precipices on the other side and by the time the sun was up we had already made half the ascent of the mountain the view from here is very beautiful the stupendous rocks may be seen on one side of the chasm with the immense prairies of la mesa de los santos stretching away as far as the eye can reach losing themselves in the horizon to the south one of the tributaries of the river subi after creeping along the plain for some distance suddenly falls over the rocks with a bound of a hundred feet resolving itself into spray and rainbows in the chasm below i had been informed that catlia mendelii was still to be found in quantities on the eastern range of the andes so after leaving the precipices of subi i turned off in the direction of a small village called curiti at the foot of the range of mountains so celebrated for orchids here i left my mules and proceeded on foot the vegetation is somewhat semi-tropical lovely ferns and selaginellas being very luxuriant as well as the feathery bamboos but with an absence of the fine rich timber trees and towering palms of the lower grounds here amongst the scores of humming-birds which flit from flower to flower i made the acquaintance of one which i had not seen before and which i believe was the prettiest i had ever seen this is known in england as the blue sylph having two long feathers in the tail like those of the swallow but of the most resplendent metallic blue here also the rare and beautiful swallow-tailed kite may be seen wheeling gracefully overhead all day but far out of gunshot i had not far to go before i was rewarded with the object of my search in the myriads of bromeliaceae and orchids which literally cover the short stunted trees and the bare points of rocks where scarcely an inch of soil is to be found the most magnificent sight for even the most stoical observer are the immense clumps of cattleya mendelii each new bulb bearing four or five of its gorgeous rose-coloured flowers many of them growing in the full sun or with very little shade 
and possessing a glowing color which is very difficult to get in the stuffy hot houses where the plants are cultivated some of these plants considering their size and the slowness of growth must have taken many years to develop for i have taken plants from the trees with five hundred bulbs and as many as one hundred spikes of flowers which to a lover of orchids is a sight worth travelling from europe to see apart from the few extraordinary specimens the orchids as a rule are very much crowded and mixed up with other vegetation the accompanying picture from a photograph taken on the spot represents a tree growing in its natural state in the forest the higher branches are covered with a long white lichen a little lower is an immense clump of tillandsias while the branch on the right hand is inhabited by some oncidiums the next plant lower down is a nice piece of cattleya mendelii the whole of the mountains at this time of my visit were crowded with the famous parasite like most of my predecessors i was tempted to bear away a large quantity of the coveted plants besides exploring the mountains and enjoying much of their beauty end of chapter eight recording by arnold banner thurmond north carolina chapter nine of travels and adventures of an orchid hunter by albert milliken this librivox recording is in the public domain in search of odontoglossum crispum my next journey was in search of the popular orchid odontoglossum crispum which i had been informed was to be found so far in the interior of colombia as the department of cundinamarca on the slopes of the andes in the vicinity of the capital city to reach this place would necessitate a journey of about two hundred miles on horses or mules this mode of travelling is more monotonous more tiresome and more expensive than the adventurous life of the forest the general direction of the track is south but it has many deviations going through the state of santander a short distance in the state of boyaca and terminating in the state of cundinamarca passing on the way some twelve small towns and villages one or two indian the others of the old spanish style many of them being extremely pretty in situation and construction several of the villages are celebrated for the desperate conflicts which took place between the spaniards and the natives of colombia in the terrible war of independence i will only particularize one or two of the principal towns to enumerate more would only be to weary the reader with repetitions after a long toilsome day's journey over the rocky heights of the andes i arrived at the town called sanjil a town of some fourteen thousand inhabitants beautifully situated on the banks of the river fonce it was originally peopled by the guave indians and dates from the year sixteen twenty it is notable for its well-built edifices mostly of stone of excellent spanish workmanship a cave is shown full of human skeletons probably all that now remains of its early indian owners another day's journey over the same mountain heights brought us to the town called el socorro this is nearly four thousand feet above the level of the sea with a lovely climate built on the banks of a river it has four churches and a convent besides many very excellent buildings and perhaps the best suspension bridge in colombia which is very ancient in appearance this town is notable as being one of the principal places in which the revolution of the independence commenced on the sixteenth of march seventeen eighty one when the taxes and ill-treatment of the spanish government had become almost intolerable a peasant woman of the name of maria vargas tore down the list of taxes and the spanish coat of arms which was hung in the plaza and broke them in pieces this excited the people so much that although independence was not proclaimed for twenty-nine years after this was really the beginning of the war two days of rough riding in the burning sun brought me to a small indian village called san benito the climate of this place is exceedingly good all the year round being built on a high ridge on the tops of the andes i found the people most inhospitable 
and the houses mostly thatched with straw and very bad keeping along the track we passed on the way a small town called puente nacional most picturesquely built on the banks of a river about one half of the houses being on each side the buildings as usual are very good and a pretty church is an ornament to the place for five days journey the track had run through the most miserable class of vegetation apart from the curious undulating tops of the mountains which sometimes extend away into most glorious scenery nothing is to be seen but a miserable scrub and the eye becomes weary with the endless expanse of moss and short stunted shrubs when we came to some wayside farm or plantation the clumps of orange trees laden with their wealth of golden fruit somewhat broke the monotony a few flocks of sheep and stray cattle wandered about over the immense wastelands but an almost entire absence of birds and other animal life gave the tops of the andes an appearance of desert loneliness as a rule in the early morning and in the evening the tops of the mountains are enveloped in thick mist and the track was scarcely visible the rising sun gradually dispelled this from the peaks only leaving straggling patches in the valleys at the town called puente nacional i was delighted to find a somewhat better class of vegetation commence and this seems to be the limit of the growth of the cattleya mendelii and the commencement of the gorgeous flowered cattleya warsowitzii in the mountains near to this town in the flowering season of the plants the display in the woods is most superb high trees in some places are so hung with these glorious epiphytes that very little is to be seen but a blaze of purple and rose a small epidendrum with scarlet flowers makes up the finishing touch on leaving puente nacional we had not gone far before the track led us to still higher mountains and here was the division between the states of santander and boyaca near a small village called saboya from the top of this we obtained a magnificent view of the plain on which the city of bogota is built this plain is more than one hundred miles in length and in many places three miles broad for the most part beautifully level pasture land or cultivated and bearing waving crops of wheat and barley large quantities of potatoes are also grown we very quickly descended to the plain and arrived at another town called chichinquira this is the yearly resort of thousands of pilgrims who come to the church to pay their devotions in the belief that a picture of the virgin mary which is here was painted by a miracle the story runs that a poor woman had coarse cloth nailed in the window of her house to keep out the wind when one morning she is said to have found the picture miraculously painted on the cloth the church of the pilgrims which is called the church of our lady of chichinquira is adorned with great riches in marble paintings gold and precious stones and it is calculated that the money brought by pilgrims into this place every year amounts to thirty thousand dollars or about six thousand pounds sterling the climate of this place which is about eight thousand feet above the sea level as well as the whole of the savannah of bogota is cool and agreeable at this town we are still a distance of seventy-five miles from bogota which is three days journey on horses after riding all day over a most fertile plain we stayed for the night at a small village called ubate and from here the road is wide and level and is continually traversed by bullock wagons on their way to and from the capital the next day's ride brought us to a large and important town called sipaquera the houses and plazas here are of the best and most elegant construction but of a style which the spanish immigrant must have learnt from the moors the effect of the peculiar tiling and towers when seen from a distant height is most pleasing and fantastic this town is built on the edge of the immense salt mines which supply the whole of this part of colombia with salt being literally a huge mountain of that substance which was known to the earliest indians the excavations begin in the side of the hill and run level with the ground the cavity extending over half a mile the roof in many places being fifty feet in height 
a wall of salt occasionally intermixed with veins of pyrites of iron the sight presented to the visitor who enters these immense vaults is truly magnificent occasional drops of water have covered the roofs with myriads of stalactites of every imaginable form of beauty while the sides dazzle with rock and salt crystals which make one believe one has entered some gem palace or diamond caves these mines are the property of and worked by the government of colombia and although the system of working is somewhat primitive the salt taken from these hills produces something like one million dollars paper money yearly the town of sipaquera is a distance of thirty miles from bogota in the dry season the road is very good and stage coaches run every two days the scenery along the road is most picturesque for ten miles a line of willows have been planted and these form a perfect avenue besides making an agreeable shade and on each side of the immense plain the continued chain of the andes rises high and breaks into frowning precipices giving an increased charm to the surroundings of bogota after a delightful ride i arrived at about two o'clock in the afternoon at one of the suburban villages called chapinero a tramway has lately been constructed from here to bogota and the strange mixture of traffic along this road is most curious the dusky indian with his old-fashioned pack mule donkey riders and elegant horsemen tram cars and carriages all jostle each other along the dusty road the entrance to the village is especially pretty and even along the road the rich colombians have built beautiful villas with pleasant gardens and surroundings some moorish some persian and even indian and japanese architecture is represented with an extravagance of italian marble and paintings scarcely credible all this making an agreeable entrance to this isolated andean city entering the city of bogota from the north side the visitor is disappointed in finding the streets narrow and dirty and the houses miserably tumble down but in a very short time we arrive at the park san diego a small recreation ground tastefully laid out and beautifully ornamented with fountains and statues the principal one being a full-sized bronze figure of the statesman and soldier simon bolivar the dome and pedestal are of italian workmanship very tastefully made and the whole is surmounted by a gilded condor the town of bogota the capital of what is now called the republic of colombia was founded according to history on the sixth of august fifteen twenty eight and in the year fifteen forty carlos the fifth of spain raised it to the rank of city with many other privileges it numbers about one hundred and fifty thousand inhabitants and covers an area of some two millions of square yards situated at an altitude of eight thousand feet above the level of the sea and only four degrees thirty six minutes north of the equator except for the slight inconvenience of the rarefied air produced by the altitude bogota possesses one of the most healthy climates to be found having a medium temperature of fifteen degrees centigrade all the year round the city abounds in edifices of interest including a magnificent cathedral the municipal buildings take up one side of the principal square the residence of the president of the republic in the immense building called the mint was coined at the time when gold was as plentiful here as in australia one hundred million dollars in gold and seven millions in silver coin there is also an excellent library containing about fifty thousand volumes a museum crowded with thousands of natural history specimens and curiosities besides an astronomical observatory founded as lately as the year eighteen o three which claims to be one of the highest in the world the manners of living and the dress of the people are with few exceptions entirely european and poodle dogs and perambulators are as much a nuisance on the sidewalks and gardens of bogota as they are in london as a rule in the colombian towns there is a peculiar spirit of easy indolence and want of stir which paralyzes business and the colombians as well as the indians motto is always manana 
or tomorrow. In Bogota, however, there is an exception. There seem to be fewer loafers. Everyone appears to be occupied and to go about his business, and especially in the principal streets there is quite a bustle. Continuing along towards the center of the city, we come to another small park called Park Santander. This is planted with a profuse wealth of tropical trees and foliage plants, and is the principal resort of the Colombian idler, the luxuriant sandbox trees forming an ample shade. The center of the park or plaza is ornamented with a bronze statue of General Santander, and the whole arrangement shows the greatest care and good taste. On leaving this park we pass over the first of fifteen bridges, which are all built inside the city over two mountain streams, both of which rush noisily through the principal streets. The business houses are about half Colombian and half foreign. They are, as a rule, overflowing with merchandise, drapery goods, and hardware. I believe almost anything may be bought here that is to be found anywhere else although Bogota is 700 miles from the seaport, and nearly 100 of this journey is made over the Andes on muleback. Yet the iron workers from Birmingham, the cotton workers of Manchester, Benson's watches, totes wearing apparel, with Morton's hams and Peak Freen's biscuits, all find a sure representative in Bogota in spite of the difficulties of mud and mosquitoes which are thrown in the way of the traveler. The French, German, and American houses are nowhere behind in the market. The produce of the country is sold here every day in a large enclosure set apart for this purpose called the market, and this forms one of the most complete collections of fruit and vegetables which the world can give. Apples, strawberries, plums, and cherries mix with their tropical relations, pines, bananas, figs, and mangoes while on the other hand potatoes and cabbages are as plentiful here as yams cassava roots and pumpkins in fact any one who will take a european cook to bogota may live in epicurean luxury the religion of the capital as well as of the whole civilized part of the country is roman catholic but all creeds are tolerated and in bogota a very nice protestant church has been constructed besides a large number of schools and colleges there is what is called the national university founded in eighteen sixty seven in this institution every branch of higher education is taught and the school for medicine in bogota has long been celebrated these schools admit something like five thousand students every year and ten thousand more would be necessary to somewhat advance the educational condition of this immense country although there is not much liberty of the press some twenty-five newspapers are printed in bogota several of them daily the principal and central square of the city is called la plaza de bolivar it is very much more spacious than that of its rival at caracas the situation is most agreeable one side being taken up by the large cathedral and the other three sides by gay shops hotels and imposing municipal buildings while the centre of the plaza is occupied by a beautiful piece of bronze in the form of a statue of bolivar perhaps the best work of art to be found in all the city this was made by the celebrated italian sculptor tenerani at the expense of a rich colombian signor paris and placed in bogota in the year eighteen forty six as a mark of the friendship which had existed between the great soldier and the giver of the statue as well as to commemorate the many glorious victories won by bolivar in the service of colombia it is a marvel how this beautiful piece of bronze could have been safely transported over the andes as everything must be carried on the backs of mules or bullocks the ladies of bogota are very rarely seen outside during the middle of the day and only occasionally in the evening but on Sunday morning, about the time of the morning mass, a foreigner taking a stroll in front of the cathedral may get some idea of what sort of people really inhabit this mountain hermitage. Hundreds of women of all ages and every position crowd towards the church. There is the short, clumsy native servant wearing a dress of all the colors of the rainbow. There is the graceful half-blood with a perfect form and olive skin. 
contrary to the general rule some lovely blonde will be dressed all in white but the perfection of the colombian ladies might be mistaken for a piece of animated marble the loose black church-going robe lends additional charm to the venus-like form and the spanish mantilla loosely thrown over a wealth of raven hair makes a suitable frame for one of the most perfect types of beauty la colombiana however much history and experience reminds us that one-third of the country is peopled with the wildest of indians the foreigner who takes a turn in the plaza de bolivar on a sunday morning would think they had never been to bogota although colombian soldiers do not make much of a show they are celebrated for their straight shooting and valor in bogota there is a considerable garrison together with all the paraphernalia and accoutrements of a standing army these are not needed to combat with exterior powers but about every three years they indulge in a revolution or an insurrection against the powers that be and colombian kills colombian until often very few are left causing an immense loss of life and property with very little advantage to either party in times of revolution however foreigners who do not mix in the party feeling are not molested in the least except by the want of communications and i may say here that for the travelling foreigner there is perhaps no country in the world where he is received with such hospitality and so much friendliness both the telephone and electric light have been introduced into bogota and a line of railway to connect this city with the magdalena river has been some time in the course of construction but if ever it is possible it will be years before the end is achieved on account of the immense chain of the andes between bogota and the magdalena which will require an outlay of some millions of dollars coupled with the greatest engineering skill to break through the number of inhabitants in bogota fluctuates considerably with the season many of the people possess country houses or campos and on the approach of the dry season they leave the crowded town and take to the fields where each one occupies himself raising crops tending cattle or in the coffee and banana plantations one cause of the difference in population according to the season is that a large number of indians come in from the hills bringing the produce of their hunting or cultivation for sale in bogota and in return buy what little they can afford in the shops and then leave for their mountain homes till the next season another cause is the constant string of foreigners arriving continually from almost every country in the world these stay a week a fortnight or a month as business demands and they in turn seek other parts where the commercial traveller can tell yarns about his experiences in bogota and the road to it the country is governed by the senate and a chamber of deputies and these are directed by the president the president dr rafael nunez has held this important position three times his last term of office extending over a period of six years which will terminate in july next year dr nunez does not live in bogota but he is represented there by a vice-president who is invested with acting power in all state affairs while the president enjoys life in his pretty country home near the city of cartagena president nunez is now about sixty-six years of age he was in early life president of the state of bolivar also consul for colombia in liverpool and havre besides filling the important positions of minister of finance and prime minister of his own country he is a man of great force of character and refined literary tastes and speaks fluently several languages all the environs of bogota are pretty and picturesque especially the two peaks called montserrat and guadalupe in the immediate vicinity and overlooking the city of bogota this extraordinary formation seems to have been one mountain but earthquakes and torrents have cut a wide breach and left the two peaks separated by a yawning chasm the one called guadalupe reaches a height of something like two thousand feet above the level of the city and ten thousand feet above the sea a small hermitage was built on the top of the mountain as far back as the year sixteen fifty six but this was destroyed by an earthquake in eighteen twenty seven 
forty years after another church was commenced as well as a monument the whitewashed columns of these edifices may be seen from almost every part of the plain below appearing like grim forts built to defend the city which will probably never be in danger the other height called montserrat is separated from its neighbor only by a deep ravine on the summit of this peak another church has been built also whitewashed this is somewhat lower than the other and is approached by a winding track in some parts almost perpendicular a perpetual spring running out of the mountain has given rise to many legends imputing miraculous power to its limpid waters all that i saw about the water was that it appeared to me the purest and most sparkling i have ever seen another and perhaps the most important of all the natural beauties of the surroundings of bogota is the celebrated waterfall called el tequendama which is situated at a distance of about twelve miles from the city in a southwesterly direction the journey to the falls on horseback is very pleasant the bridle path runs through the fertile plantations and richly stocked pastures of the colombian farmers at a considerable distance the low rumbling roar of the cataract may be heard resembling distant thunder and the nearer one approaches the falls the more beautiful the scenery the river funza first coming from the higher andes at this altitude winds peacefully over a comparatively level plain until it comes to a fearful abyss over which the waters dash to fall a distance of four hundred and fifty feet the mighty precipices which wall in this wild rush of water rise to a height of about five hundred feet they are beautiful with flowering shrubs mosses selaginellas and orchids which in many instances are suspended over the boiling waters while large crowds of tropical birds move about amongst the suspended vegetation lending a tint of color and life to the grim boulders no visitor ever comes away disappointed every one leaves al tequendama with an indelible impression of the grandeur of the spectacle and some have even dared to call it a rival to the famous niagara End of chapter 9 Recording by Arnold Banner, Thurmond, North Carolina Chapter 10 of Travels and Adventures of an Orchid Hunter by Albert Milliken This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Pacho This most popular orchid, Odontoglossum crispum, is found over a very wide range of country extending on the north from the borders of the state of cundinamarca to the frontier of ecuador on the south but although the district of the plant is so large a little town called pacho has always been the rendezvous of the collectors of odontoglossum crispum and it has already secured for itself fame in having produced the best varieties this in many respects is right as the flowers found in the range of mountains directly adjoining this village are as a rule round and full of a fine form and beautifully fringed while on the more southern range the flowers are of the type known as starry or having the petals very much divided one from another but many perfectly white flowers are found amongst the pacho plants and less of the highly blotched or spotted varieties so much sought after by connoisseurs while on the other hand the starry varieties are as a rule mixed with thickly spotted flowers even while in bogota i was on my way to these happy hunting grounds and after a few days of looking around i started for pacho the distance is about fifty miles from bogota and the road by way of sipaquera is very good the traveller will pass on the way the house of a rich colombian don de matreo parades this is really a palace where there is collected together one of the most beautiful displays of costly furniture and bric-a-brac to be found in colombia from the town of sipiquera the track runs directly over the salt mine and continues up to a height of about eight thousand five hundred feet to what is called the paramo then descends gradually to the town of pacho this occupies about two days as most people find the journey sufficient 
to ride from Bogota to Sipaquera in one day. The appearance of the village of Pacho from the heights above is very picturesque. It is built in a valley, and just on the edge of some magnificent cattle estates. Besides this, the houses are of fairly good construction. An Englishman of the name of Mr. Bunch was at one time the owner of the extensive coal and iron mines here and he has done much to improve the social condition of Pacho. The plant collector who arrives here very naturally thinks he will find the coveted Odontoglossum in the streets of the town, but as a rule the ardor of most of them is somewhat damped when they learn that a journey of three days must be made to the mountains before they can find a plant, if they would see it in its natural state. It took me very much longer within a circuit of fifty miles some plants are to be found but especially in the direction of what is called san cayetano and to arrive here it is necessary to hire mules and provide provisions for three days journey i left pacho in the month of march in the very height of the dry season i was delighted to get away as the facilities for living in pacho are very bad although always better than in the mountains on the way from the town we passed the iron works. These are very important for Colombia, there being only two mines worked in the whole country. Here the labor is done by natives superintended by a few Englishmen. They informed me that the neighboring hills contain immense deposit of iron and coal, which are brought down on the backs of mules or in bullock wagons. Before we reached the foot of the chain of mountains we had to cross the magnificent cattle estate some miles in extent, which takes in the whole of the valley of Pacho. The land is very fertile, besides having an excellent climate and an abundance of water. We were not long in taking to the mountain track. The huge peak almost awed us as we looked up to it, towering above us to a height of two thousand feet, and as we ascended the scenery took the most fantastic form immense boulders of incalculable height seemed to have been torn from their position and stood on edge the stunted vegetation is crowded with large quantities of parasites of the family loranthus living on the sap of the tree which supports them many of these plants have lovely flowers and one in particular which was new to me was covered with brilliant scarlet waxy tubes about three inches long these, of course, being utterly impossible to export in plant form, seeing that they derive their life from the sap of the tree on which they hang. All the birds I saw were birds of prey, probably on account of the shelter provided for them in the wild, impenetrable precipices which form the mountainside. Hawks, kites, and eagles wheeling around, poising themselves in mid-air, or swooping down with a fierce dart only to rise again bearing some careless squirrel or stray rabbit. Occasionally a pair of condors might be seen, looking, even at that height, like giants amongst their neighbors. It was only after immense toil that I made half the ascent of the mountain. Then I discovered that the boy who carried the provisions was nowhere to be seen. I had expected him to follow in the track. It was now after midday, and I had only passed one miserable hut where with difficulty i had been able to procure a little refreshment anxiously looking for the boy at every turn i kept on up the mountain until towards evening being then about eight thousand feet above the level of the sea when a thick mist came over the top of the mountain and rendered it almost impossible to keep the track i had heard that on the wide plain which forms the top of the mountain there was only one solitary hut so to reach this with a tired mule was my determined aim. The conflicting tracks which intersect each other across the vast plain made progress doubly difficult. The first and most important thing in crossing this paramo is to have an experienced guide. No European could possibly find his way alone, and even the best guides are often at a loss. Finally we arrived at the hut which had been dismantled by a recent hurricane the fierce storm having taken away more than half the roof. The cold was intense, near freezing. The inhabitants of the hut were a family of the poorest Indians, and although the only resources I could see were a few potatoes, 
their hospitality and good nature were scarcely credible having only brought the clothing with me which i used in the lowlands i suffered very much from the cold almost the only vegetation found here is a large edelweiss which covers acres of the top of the paramo it is a plant growing about a yard high the leaves stems and flowers being entirely enveloped in a woolly substance probably to protect it from the cold the other vegetation at this altitude is scarcely worth a name sometimes hail falls in large quantities and nothing seems to give much result under cultivation except potatoes of these the natives grow enough for their subsistence from one season to another my first night passed at a height of twelve thousand feet above the level of the sea was miserable enough on account of the cold and the swarms of vermin i was glad to get away early in the morning although i had every reason to be grateful to the hospitable indians who knowing that our provisions were lost on the way gave us largely of their own little resources in various parts of the paramo i met with three birds which i was surprised to find the first a tiny hummingbird steganura under woody eye with the feet enveloped in tufts of white down like miniature stockings and two fine feathers in the tail longer than the rest which finish by widening out at the end into a piece about the size of a silver threepence the second was a hummingbird usually met with in the lower lands feeding on the flowers of datura depressa its bill seems to have grown with its necessity to reach the honey in the extremity of the long tubed flowers the bill of this extraordinary little mite is about two inches long and of the thickness of a darning needle being quite half an inch longer than the body this variety of hummingbird is known to naturalists as the dosimastes insiferus the third was a bird about the size of a starling gaudily colored the upper part of the body black the breast a brilliant scarlet while a streak of rich blue ornaments each wing and as the bird flits across the plain with a springing motion the alternate blue and scarlet makes a pretty effect this i judged to be the posilithropus lunulata the mist had scarcely risen from the top of the mountains when we came in sight of the valley and the range of mountains on the other side where i expected to find odontoglossum odoratum knowing that this variety is found growing at a lower altitude than the odontoglossum crispum although they are both often found at a high altitude growing on the same tree by evening we had made the descent of the tortuous path to the village of san cayetano most of the journey being made in a blinding rain this village is situated on the very edge of the odontoglossum forests i expected to find some one here who would help me to get plants in the woods but the people were too indolent for me to persuade them to work for wages so i rested here for the night and then kept on the journey further into the woods to a place called el ortiz i was told here i could find people who would be willing to work in the mountains we had scarcely entered the forest on this side of the mountain when i remarked a difference from anything i had seen before the trees here were so grown together that they made a thick wood while every branch and trunk was laden with a heavy coat of trailing lichen perfectly dripping with water so much so that riding under them our clothes were quickly wet through in these natural reservoirs the odontoglossums find their home at an altitude of from seven to eight thousand feet above the sea with a temperature which often falls as low in the night as fifty degrees fahrenheit and i have never seen the thermometer rise above fifty nine fahrenheit at midday odontoglossum odoratum is most conspicuous as well for its heavily branched spike of flowers as for its powerful smell which fills the air until it becomes oppressive the plants are almost hidden from sight in the trailing mass of lichen and when they are not in flower they are difficult to find i arrived at night at the hut called el ortiz after a toilsome ride but the whole journey had been made through a wealth of orchids being informed by the natives that the odontoglossum crispum had all been taken away from here leaving only the odontoglossum odoratum 
i was obliged to continue my journey over the top of the mountain range along a track which is too bad to describe but at the same time the scenery is very beautiful after three days journey passing on the way a lovely valley rich with patches of sugar-cane and maize and also a small village called buena vista i struck into the forest in the direction of the emerald mine here at an altitude of about eight thousand five hundred feet above the sea level i found an abundance of plants their magnificent spikes of flower looking doubly beautiful hanging from the branches of the trees some high up out of reach of the native climbers and others so low as to be easily pulled off by hand my next consideration was to muster a company of natives sufficient to enable me to secure a quantity of the mountain treasures i had come so far to seek these natives i engaged to the number of about thirty in the nearest village called maripi here also we found sufficient provisions for about a week these were taken on the backs of mules to the edge of the forest and then each man was supplied with his pack to carry through the forest to where we intended to make our camp away on the edge of a mountain stream the journey with the provisions took us two days and on arriving at the site of our proposed camp we lost no time in constructing a rude hut which served to shelter us for the first night in which we eventually improved sufficiently to afford us protection for about a month in those immense forests where a few acres of clearing is considered a great benefit and where clearings made if not attended to become forests again in three years cutting down a few thousands of trees is no serious injury so i provided my natives with axes and started them out on the work of cutting down all the trees containing valuable orchids and although for the first day or two they were very much given to mistake a clump of bromeliaceae or maxillaria for a dontoglossum crispum they soon became adepts at plant collecting and would bring to our camp several hundreds of plants each night with occasionally a few odontoglossum odoratum and odontoglossum corodinii mixed amongst them after about two months work we had secured about ten thousand plants cutting down to obtain these some four thousand trees moving our camp as the plants became exhausted in the vicinity our next consideration was how to transport these plants to where sawn wood could be obtained first they had to be taken to the edge of the forest on men's backs and even then we were five days journey from the town of pacho where it is usual to make the boxes to pack the orchids in for shipment to england we got over our difficulty by making about forty capacious baskets of thin sticks cut in the forest in these we packed all the plants and carried them on the backs of bullocks to pacho where they were quickly placed in strong wooden cases being still ten days journey from the coast from here mules are employed to travel with them to the banks of the magdalena river and from there the steamboats quickly transport them to the coastal town from the little village called maripi the celebrated emerald mines of muzo may be reached by about two days riding on mules probably very few people accustomed to see those lovely gems in their cut and mounted state have any idea of the difficulties to be undergone by those who would traverse this part of the andes where the emerald mines are situated the scenery is of the most extraordinary and beautiful to be found in colombia but in the two days riding the traveller is obliged to pass through some of the most dangerous mountain passes and over precipices where a false step would dash him and the mule to destruction on arriving in the vicinity of the mines the general appearance of the place would give one the idea that it was an extinct volcano but the emeralds are found in the bottom of the crater the piece of ground now being worked is surrounded by high mountains in a circle giving it the form of a basin all accounts of the exact date of the discovery of these mines seem to be somewhat faulty although it is certain that they were known to the early indians for some emeralds have been found in the graves of indians who must have been buried long before the conquest of the country by the spaniards the present system of working the mines has been employed about one hundred years the mines are now the property of the government of colombia 
who rent them to a company who employ five or six overseers and about four hundred native workmen. The means used for working the mines are very primitive, but they yield every year a very large amount of precious stones, which are immediately shipped to Europe. The bank of rock in which the precious crystals are found is more than one thousand feet high, formed of black shale veined with pyrites of iron. Very few emeralds are found in the black stone, but by cutting down the face of the immense precipice, veins of white stone, calcite, a crystallized form of carbonate of lime, are uncovered in these veins. The emeralds are sometimes embedded and sometimes found in hollow cavities. The work of cutting down the side of the rock is done by the natives, their most powerful implement being a crowbar. A piece of rock about a yard wide is taken, the whole length of the mine, on the top. This is cut down a few yards, and then another level of the same is commenced again at the top, until the whole breast of the rock appears like a monster staircase, the broken rubbish being thrown over to the bottom of the precipice. On an opposite bank from where the emeralds are taken out, a stream of water is kept by means of sluices in a reservoir, and, as the sluices are opened every quarter of an hour, the water is allowed to rush down the rocks with great force, clearing away with the torrent all the broken stone thrown down by the miners since the last discharge. The Colombian gentlemen who live here in charge of the workmen are among the most hospitable I have ever met, and whatever traveler chances to stray that way may be sure of a welcome from the emerald miners who live in this mountain fastness, sometimes for a whole year, without making a journey to the adjoining towns. They informed me that they had explored the whole of the surrounding mountains for emeralds, and had found many places which yielded green stones, but none to produce the beautiful, pure, and dark green gems which are so prized, except the piece of rock now being worked, or at least not to produce enough to pay for the cost of working. The next place of interest in the neighborhood is the village called La Palma. This is two and a half days' journey on mules from the emerald mines in a northwesterly direction, being situated much lower than the Odontoglossum crispum district. The adjoining hills produce most splendid forms of Cattleya warsawitzii. The ride is most enjoyable, the track lying through most beautiful scenery especially along the banks of one small stream where the trees are literally covered with Cattleya labiata. When I passed that way, a large number of them were in flower, presenting a sight of indescribable orchid beauty. Further along I met with a pretty delicate variety of Comparetia, hung on the very tips of the branches of a kind of willow overhanging the water, so near that in the rainy season they must be submerged while the majority of them must always be wet with spray. The village of La Palma is one of the best of the old Spanish style, most curiously situated in a hollow of the tops of the mountains, which look like extinct volcanoes. The people are remarkably hospitable, and receive all travelers with the greatest kindness. Unhappily, the magnificent varieties of Warsawitzii have been cleared away from the neighborhood long ago, and now, as in other parts, the orchid collector must take a journey of at least two days into the heart of the forest to get his plants, or send someone and wait three weeks in idleness and suspense in a monotonous village. The track into the forest is miserably bad, and to reach the plants is even dangerous. But those who have seen them in their forest home in all the glory of Cattleya Warsawitzii will admit with me that the site is worth all the trouble of forest life. When I say that the sight of the plant in flower is very beautiful, orchid fanciers at home will imagine that large quantities are to be seen in bloom at once. This is not generally the case with any class of orchids I have seen in their native woods. It is rare to see a tree with more than four or five plants, and these perhaps not all in flower at once. But in the good districts, before the plants were taken away so much, almost every tree and ledge of rock would have some one or more specimens in bloom, so that a large quantity might be seen in the course of one day. Near La Palma, but on higher, cooler ground, 
I found a few small plants of Miltonia phalaenopsis, and in another locality quite a clump of Oncidium cramerianum, as well as Chysis, Bolias, and various Oncidiums. The vicinity of Muzo, near the Emerald Mine, is where I have found the largest quantity of the glorious blue butterfly, Morpho cypress, some of them measuring seven inches across the wings, of a radiant blue that few artists' pencils can depict. Although Cattleya warsawitzii is exported largely from La Palma, it is also found growing mixed with Cattleya dowiana aurea in the state of Antioquia. I have collected Odontoglossum pescatorii in the hills near to Ocaña, in the department of Santander. But it would be wearisome to my readers to enumerate all that occurs in the tiresome ten days of riding over the Andes from the town of Bucaramanga to the Pescatorii grounds. On the top of one of the high mountains on the way, near a village called Cachiri, at a height of ten thousand feet above the sea level, I passed on the side of the track thousands of Mastivalias, chiefly of the Haryana variety. On another hill, two days' journey further along, but much lower, the trees are hung to crowding with a dainty little Oncidium cuculatum. Any future novice orchid hunter in search of Odontoglossum pescatorii will find it by leaving the town of Ocaña, passing across the magnificent plains called La Savana de la Cruz, and entering the chain of the Andes on the western side here amongst the matted moss-grown vegetation pescatorii is growing side by side with odontoglossum triumphans while the creeping rhizomes of odontoglossum coronarium cover the roots of the same trees and i have seen the curious anguloa clausii and the pretty ada aurantiaca here as well while in the cooler parts that choice little odontoglossum blandum grows in profusion in a peculiar mist which reminds one of a continual turkish bath it is all very well to see this fastidious little orchid in its natural beauty but it is quite another thing to succeed in bringing it home to england alive many of the plants die before they leave the coast many more before they pass the west indies a few reach the azores and fewer still arrive in england safely End of chapter 10. Recording by Arnold Banner, Thurmond, North Carolina. Chapter 11 of Travels and Adventures of an Orchid Hunter by Albert Milliken. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Port of Honda. The Cattleya Trianae has been found for years near the town of Ibagué in the state of Tolima, a little more than one hundred miles from Bogota in a southwesterly direction. This Cattleya is found under much the same circumstances as the others of its family, at an altitude of about four thousand feet above sea level. To reach it, it is necessary to ascend the river Magdalena for a considerable distance and then land on the west bank. There is little of interest in the mule ride except the sight of the majestic snow-capped mountains called the Paramo de Ruiz. These tower up to the height of 16,000 feet, with a glistening top of eternal snow, which makes them conspicuous at a great distance from many parts of the road. Catlia Triane is found over a wide area, but all the plants taken from these parts, as well as from Pacho, La Palma, etc., must be brought to a small town called Honda. This is the principal port of the Magdalena River, about 600 miles from the sea. Swift running rapids prevent the larger steamboats going further up the river than Honda, but another line of boats has been built above the rapids. These vessels navigate the river for three hundred miles more to a place called Neva. Hundreds of mules, carrying every imaginable class of produce, throng the road from Bogota to Honda. On arriving on the banks of the Magdalena, everything in the way of cargo, animals, and human beings that would reach the town must embark in a curious kind of raft 
attached to a strong chain stretching across the river. Immediately the raft is loosened from the side, the force of the water carries it across the river, the pulley running along the supporting chain. This raft is worked from six o'clock in the morning until six in the evening, the small fee of two pence halfpenny being charged for passing a horse and his rider, three halfpence for a mule load, and a penny for a foot passenger. A line of railway connects this place with the town of Honda, and runs to the part of the river where the steamboats land, called Yeguas, about four miles from Honda. At this point the mountains, which wall in the valley of the Magdalena, are very near to each other, and there seems to be no breeze which ever reaches the town. It is proverbially known all over the country as being very hot, and I have seldom seen the thermometer fall below 95 degrees Fahrenheit in the shade. It is a curiously built little town, with neither system nor design in the architecture. It was at one time large and important, but earthquakes have proved its ruin, and now the fine churches, convents, hospitals, and even a beautiful stone bridge have all been destroyed. Travelers to the interior must inevitably pass this way, and every one will find lodging houses and facilities for hiring mules, etc., to help him on his way to the capital. When I got on board the steamboat here to descend the Magdalena River, I practically said good-bye for the time being to four states of this magnificent country, Boyaca, Cundinamarca, El Cauca, and El Tolima. No pen or picture has or ever will be able to give more than a faint idea of the glories of this part of Colombia, of its riches in mines of emeralds and gold and silver, of its agricultural products of coffee, cocoa, and grain, of its trackless forests with their exhaustless supply of timber and choice woods, its wealth of ornamental and medicinal plants, its bevies of gaudy-colored birds and curious animals, its snow-capped mountains and boundless prairies where the Indians have always roamed with perfect freedom, or of its commercial cities with their rich and cultivated inhabitants. Even the most stoical Englishman who has traveled here and seen its beauties cannot help but regret that so many thousand miles divide this paradise from our own little island. The descent of the river Magdalena was made quickly and agreeably, and we very soon arrived at the port called Puerto Berrio. This is the port by which travelers reach the prosperous city of Medellin, one of the most important centers of the country, and the home of Catlia Dawiana Aurea and Catlia Warsawitsii. Puerto Berrio has a special interest to all English orchid collectors. A rough cross of wood on the edge of the forest, on the higher bank of the river, marks the last resting place of Chesterton, the well-known orchid collector, who did such good service for the firm of James Vetch and Sons long before the wholesale plunder and extermination of the plants brought about by modern collectors. A small mountain town called Frontino has given up to the present all the Miltonia vexillaria, but the woods in the vicinity have become already pretty well cleared. I had heard much about the plants to be found between the river Opon and the river Carrere. These are two rivers which together drain the southern part of the state of Santander, and the land lying between them is a narrow strip less than one hundred miles wide. I descended the river to a place called Barranca Bermeja, with the object of getting a canoe to navigate the river Opon. This, I was told, would require at least six men, well armed. The river is not navigable for more than fifty miles, and the distance is intercepted by fallen trees, while the forest between the two rivers is infested by hordes of hostile Indians. The first two days nothing extraordinary happened. The banks of the river were thick forest, and we saw no tracks of the Indians. Each night we camped on a sandbank, I saw no orchids, the land being too flat, but on the third day we passed many tracks of the Indians and some abandoned huts. About midday, as we suddenly made a curve in the river, a shower of arrows whistled past us and fell far ahead. They had been aimed too high and shot with too much force. 
in the direction the arrows came from we saw nothing not even a rustling of the foliage we fired several times into the bush and proceeded more cautiously my companions would have turned back some of them becoming afraid but an unconquerable curiosity possessed me to see what there was in the way of plants on the higher ground it was evident that the indians knew by this time all along the river of our ascent and more than once i saw dusky forms creeping stealthily away from the banks as the canoe glided into sight i had been informed that the indians were very much scattered over the country and although they maintain a deadly hatred against all civilized human beings the fact of our ascending the river would not be sufficient to make them congregate in numbers and the stragglers along the banks although hostile in the highest degree are cowardly and afraid of firearms on the fourth day proceeding with the greatest difficulty on account of the fallen trees we came to some three or four small sheds with plantations of maize in front of them a few animal skins were lying about but every one of the inhabitants had taken to the woods the very emptiness of the huts showed that their manner of life must be of the most primitive kind however warlike they are towards outsiders there are accounts that they live together in the greatest friendship and good faith we left the huts very much as we found them and proceeded up the river i had seen several very pretty oncidiums on the banks and i had begun to hope that we were clear of the indians on the night of the fourth day we camped as usual on a sandbank not being able to proceed further on account of the bad state of the river knowing that we were in the very middle of the indian territory where if they chose they could overpower us with numbers any moment we passed the night somewhat nervously with a very small fire but with our rifles loaded and while three slept the other three kept watch nothing happened to us that night and early in the morning after breakfasting i started into the forest with four of the men leaving the other two in ambush to watch the canoe for fear the indians should take away our only means of getting back to the magdalena i was delighted to find the trees on the rising ground from the banks of the river hung with fine clumps of miltonia vexillaria intermixed with oncidium carthaginense and several smaller orchids and i was priding myself upon reaping a glorious harvest but that night all my plans were destined to be crushed everybody was in good spirits at our evening meal but we had scarcely finished and lighted our roll of tobacco when the twang of an arrow as a whistle passed my head startled every one to his feet in another moment one of our number was pierced with three of the deadly poisoned arrows and mortally wounded the moon was on the wane and shed a miserable light for us to shoot by while the savages could see us perfectly well by the light of our fire not a moment was lost in hiding ourselves behind the nearest trees and we were scarcely placed when another shower of arrows showed us the position of the indians seeing us retreat they had advanced more into the open at the same moment a blaze of fire poured out of five trusty rifles and a terrible howl rose from the throats of the surprised and wounded indians who up to the present had not uttered a sound in a moment every mark for us to aim at had disappeared but we fired another volley in the direction they had gone for some time after the rushing sound in the forest informed us that they were retreating and taking away their dead or wounded i thought they would return but my companions believed that the report of firearms was so little known to them that one encounter would be enough and they proved right as soon as day dawned we carefully reconnoitred in all directions however on that side we found nothing but the trail of the indians and the pools of blood left by the victims of our bullets i had been anxious to capture one of the indians so as to see what sort of people they really were as up to the present i had caught nothing of them but the faintest glimpse in this i was quite unexpectedly gratified two of the men were reconnoitering along the bank of the river near the canoe when they came upon one of the indians alone probably a scout he offered no resistance but cowered on the ground as if to beg for mercy i was surprised the two men had not shot him at first sight 
but perhaps they were moved with pity or were actuated by the same curiosity as myself at any rate i was as much surprised as the indian when the two men brought him to me he was a young man apparently about twenty-two years of age tall and of a fine physical form his skin was a rich bronze i had heard that these indians adorned themselves with feather headdresses but this one wore no ornaments his only clothing being a small piece of grass cloth tied around the loins he was armed with the usual native bow some arrows and a lance in the short time he was with us we were not successful in getting any communication whatever from him even by signs and he refused all food i succeeded in getting a photograph of him which operation i supposed he thought was to be the end of him he appeared so frightened apart from the vacant air of the untaught man of the woods he had no savage look and when left to himself in his own native haunts i should think he was good-natured we took away his weapons and then left him to return to his companions in a moment he was off with a bound like a deer and that was the last i saw of the opon indians we quickly made a suitable resting-place for our dead companion and however loath we were to leave him there we had no remedy loosing our canoe from its moorings in less than two days the rapid stream landed us in the waters of the magdalena and for the future however much i may covet the orchid gems of the headwaters of the opon they must remain there for my part until the last red man has disappeared from his territory End of chapter 11 Recording by Arnold Banner, Thurmond, North Carolina